Welcome everyone to Buddhist Center. It's so nice to see all of you tonight, once again, to look at Lama Tsongkhapa's Source of All My Good. We're so fortunate to be able to look at a text that contains everything that we need to do to be able to get rid of all of our suffering and become the most reliable guide in the universe. And by doing so, we ourselves will achieve the most infinite bliss uh, we possibly can achieve. Uh, and this is the promise that Buddha Shakyamuni made to us when he came here so compassionately uh, to show us exactly what we need to do in order to get rid of all of our sufferings and achieve the state of bliss that he was able to achieve by getting rid of the afflictive obstructions and the cognitive uh, obscurations or the obstructions to omniscience. Uh, so we currently, uh, if we haven't gotten rid of them, have these negativities within our mind stream. And the Buddha previously had these negativities in his mind stream as well. And But if we engage in the practice that the Buddha engaged in to remove the obstacles, to move, remove the negativities that he had in his mind stream, uh, then because our mind stream uh, has the same exact nature as the Buddha's mind stream, uh, we can achieve the same state of perfection that the Buddha has achieved, where all negative qualities are abandoned and only excellent qualities are possessed. Uh, and that's a far uh, place, uh, if we look at it destination-wise, uh, from where a person like me uh, is. Uh, but I know, because we have flawless instruction, uh, that if I put the effort in, uh, to practicing these instructions that the Buddha gave us like medicine to take, uh, that I will eventually, if I put in the effort, uh, and the effort will become more and more joyous uh, as I go further on down the line, uh, I will achieve that state of perfect wisdom, perfect love, perfect compassion, perfect skillful means, and perfect power, uh, just like Buddha Shakyamuni. Uh, I, we, I will not somehow merge uh, with Buddha Shakyamuni's consciousness. Uh, I will have purified my own individual consciousness, uh, and therefore my state uh, will be the state of an awakened one eventually, uh, just like the Buddha's state currently uh, is the state of the awakened one. The only difference is, is that I haven't matured my mind uh, into that state of perfection. I still have this immature mind uh, that has this self-grasping ignorance that gives rise to all uh, of the mess uh, that I have to experience uh, in terms of suffering uh, and happiness that keeps just turning into dissatisfaction and eventually a form of suffering. Uh, so anyway, before we get started and go any further into the instructions, uh, let's get into a meditative posture uh, that will help us to get our minds clear. I won't go over the instructions on the posture, but it's the seven-point Virakana posture that we get into so many times uh, uh, in order to you know, calm our minds down and get them more realistic uh, uh, before the teaching starts. And this posture helps us to do that because it frees up our mind and allows it to flow in the most, uh, uh, in the best way it can uh, if our body's in this posture because of all of our channels uh, and, and so forth are aligned, the blood flows properly, uh, we're getting all of the right oxygen to the right places and so forth. Uh, and as a result, uh, because there is this mind-body connection, uh, there's some kind of, uh, there. the great masters have told us that this particular body posture connects to the mind in such a way that allows for it to be clear. And we know that our goal in meditation, uh, in terms of if we're trying to achieve calm abiding, it's not kind of a, a doled out calm, calm state. It's a very, very clear calm, calm state. Uh, so we need to start from a place where we can mature uh, this mind into its best clarity uh, by using the tools that we currently have, uh, which are some physical things that we can incorporate incorporate uh, as tools, as supports for our minds uh, um, clearing, for our minds calming. Uh, so the seven-point Virakana posture is one, is one of those postures, not the only meditation posture, but one of those postures that was taught by many of the great Indian pandits 
uh, and and you know we find it in Laman Tsongkhapa's text and Pabunka Rinpoche's text, uh, uh, and, and we find it just in so many texts. Uh, we find this it, this seven point virakana posture. So we get into that posture, focusing on trying to keep our back as straight as possible, uh, whilst also the other six points are very very important. Uh, but just try to keep your back as straight as possible, uh, and we'll begin. Uh, by calming our minds down, trying to calm down our conceptuality with the tool of breathing uh, that the Buddha said, if we have a lot of conceptuality, uh, then here's a tool for you. Uh, and it, it's funny, uh, a lot of us in the room say, oh, I'm a, more of an advanced level. I'm not somebody uh, who has this problem, but I have news for you, probably if you are from the West <laughs> and have a cell phone uh, and have a lot of multitasking things that are going on uh, and you're running from this subject to that subject, uh, our, your mind probably has a big problem with being busy and being too, con you know, having too much conceptuality and scattering uh, going on. And the Buddha said, if that is an issue, that focusing on the breath uh, serves as an antidote. Uh, so this is the reason we get into this posture, uh, and then we focus on the breath. And we'll even see in Pabunka Rinpoche's Liberation in the Palm of Your Hand, it says sometimes we say the eight-point Vairakana posture, or there's an eighth point, uh, and that is the breath. Uh, and then there's an instruction on abandoning, you know, getting rid of this kind of messy mind uh, by focusing on a neutral object such as the breath. So uh, then you can also, uh, you know, not only, you know, calm, calm, calm the mind down to get it just realistic, you could use this as an object of observation to achieve shamatha. Uh, and then we are also going to uh, uh, multitask here uh, and add an additional object of observation in the front generation. So we're going to focus on the breathing in and out and counting of the breath. So that's three things, breathing in, breathing out, counting. Uh, and then we're going to focus on the front generation form of Buddha Shakyamuni. Beautiful and the most beautiful, just elegant uh, form that uh, you imagine that's most suitable for your mind. But just make sure that that form is very static. You're not wanting it to be animated at this point in the meditation because we're concentrating, we're working on trying to get to a fixed place uh, in our minds. Uh, eventually, we're calming it down and then trying to fix it uh, on this object. So we're we're kind of taking our mind from this place that's very busy and kind of getting it more and more and more to this point uh, of single pointed meditation. Uh, so we're using all of these things as tools to make it so that that gap is decreases, right? There's a gap here, and then we're getting it now closer to that object to where we can sit only on that object uh, and have no kind of scattering or excitement happening where we're moving towards desirous objects and we won't have any dullness or kind of lethargy happening. Um, so uh, let's, uh, let's try uh, to engage in some little practice uh, to see if we can't uh, get our minds at least a little calmer so we can listen to these teachings on Lama Tsongkhapa's uh, source of all my good uh, and understand uh, the stages of the path in a better way so that we can then live our lives uh, and practice those three things that Lord Atisha told us about uh, and said that all Buddhist teachings could be encompassed into and that all Buddhist teachings are instructions for practice. So understand that there are persons of three capacities, small, medium, and great. I shall write clearly to identify their individual characteristics. Uh, so eventually, uh, we will be able to realize those three uh, kind of capacities. We will become the being of great capacity and eventually uh, the being which is the resultant being of the practices for beings of great capacity, which is a Buddha. Uh, so let's start uh, with the meditation. Uh, and so wonderful, we have His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, in such a big form. Thank you so much, uh, Umzala Geshe Aga, again, for sending this beautiful tanka, this beautiful representation. I feel like His Holiness is right here. It almost scares me sometimes <laughs> in a good way when I walk in the room, and it always reminds me uh, that the guru is inseparable from the yidam, and the source of all my good uh, is my uh, guru, uh, is my teacher. Uh, and His Holiness the Dalai Lama uh, has been such an important uh, teacher for me over the years, and I feel so blessed uh, to have been able to receive teachings uh, from him and translate for Rinpoche, who was the abbot 
of his monastery uh, and taught at his monastery for 17 years. We're all so blessed, all of us who have been able to meet with Kensu Geshe Wanda. Uh, so uh, let's uh, um, get into that posture and let's begin breathing. Uh, uh, and let's say before we get started or go any further, um, let's say in the language of the gods and nagas and yaksas, in the language of demons and of humans too, in however many kinds of speech there may be, I shall pray, proclaim the Dharma in the language of all. Laike da ludan nojinke drubum dada mi ke nan dan drowa kunji dronan jitsampa tanchi ke du dagi juden do. So let's meditate on the focal object of the breathing in and out and the counting uh, and trying to abandon any of the negatives, things that will come into our mind that would cause our fixed meditation to be disturbed, such as excitement or scattering or sleepiness, or dullness. Uh, and if any of those things are occurring, let's catch it uh, with our uh, um, uh, uh, with our kind of vigilant mind uh, introspective mind, uh, and then let mindfulness bring you back to the focal object uh, of the breathing in and out and counting and Buddha Shakyamuni. Uh, so mindfulness and introspection are your antidotes here. Uh, forgetting the object, mindfulness. Knowing you've forgotten the object, the spy in your mind called introspection. Okay, let's get started. We're so fortunate to have met with Buddha Shakyamuni's teachings because of the kindness of so many lamas. Rejoice in the fact that you've met with a philosophy that's been passed down from an unbroken lineage and will trace back all the way to Buddha Shakyamuni, a being who has abandoned all faults and only has excellent qualities and came to the world to show us how to become that kind of being. Rejoice in the fact that we have all of the information we need to become that kind of being. Now imagine that Buddha Shakyamuni, who was in a static form, now explodes into an animated form. And in that explosion, what occurs is the entire merit field appears in the space in front of you. Imagine that Buddha Shakyamuni has been containing all the holy gurus and Buddhas and bodhisattvas this entire time. And you see them all there in the space in front of you. You see Ken Sergeshe Wandak smiling. We remember how happy he was to present the Dharma. And we think about how happy he would be right now to hear the presentation of Lama Tsongkhapa's foundation of all good qualities. He would be so pleased. Imagine you're looking into Ken Sergeshe Wandak's eyes and he's so pleased by what he sees because he came to this world in order to show us exactly how to become free. And here we are engaging in the path, learning about the path that will allow us to achieve that freedom. Imagine His Holiness the Dalai Lama, so happy. Imagining beings like Geshe Lobsang Gompo and Ken, Ken, Ken Sir Rinpoche Lozang Yatso and imagining Dema Locha Rinpoche and imagining Geshe Dorje Damdu and Umzula Geshe Aga and Geshe Mela Tenzin Ladrin and Jeffrey Hopkins and Shadow Rinpoche. Imagining all of these holy beings in the space in front of you. We're so fortunate to have been blessed by their presence. Imagining Lama Zopa Rinpoche, who just recently left this world in this physical form after doing so much for the Dharma. He was such an incredible example of joyous perseverance and realization. 
we have and have had beings that we've connected to in this world that prove that this pathway really can transform a mind. Imagine all of the beings of the extensive deeds lineage passed down from Buddha Shakyamuni to Maitreya and Asanga and Basubandhu and Dharmakirti and Dignaga and Vimuktasena and Hari Bhadra and Shakya Prabha and Guna Prabha and imagining Lama Salimpa and Atisha. All those beings were so fortunate to be connected to the beings of the profound view lineage passed down from Buddha Shakyamuni to Manjushri and Nagarjuna and Buddha Palita and Aryadeva and Chandrakirti and, Sh and Shanti Deva and Chandrashita and Baba Vega uh, and Kamala Shila. All these holy beings were so fortunate that we've been able to connect to right through the great treatise on the stages of the path to enlightenment. We're connected to those two pathways that were blazed. Uh, by Master Asanga uh, and Master Nagarjuna, those two pathways of the extensive deeds lineage and the profound view lineage were so connected to because of Lama Tsongkhapa's great treatise on the stages of the path to enlightenment. Imagining those holy beings of the lineage of blessings uh, passed down, imagining Vajradhara and Saraha and Machipa and Tilopa and Naropa and Lotsawa Marpa and Milarepa. Uh, Milarepa, who achieved that view that Lama Tsongkhapa clearly states there is no other view than the view that Milarepa uh, has found. We have been so blessed to be connected to these yogis and to these scholars, these panditas, and we really are connected to them like spiritual family. We'd be so impressed if we were related to George Washington in a family tree, but we should be so impressed that we're connected to and related to Nagarjuna and our spiritual family tree. And we're connected to and related to Milarepa who passed the teachings down to Gampopa uh, in, in terms of our spiritual family. So now imagine all those holy beings, lineage of blessings, profound view lineage, extensive deeds lineage, imagining Atisha passing down those incredible teachings to Drone Tompa, the entire Lam Rim tradition down to Drone Tompa, and imagining the three old Kadampa lineages, the incredible beings of the Nyingma tradition, Padmasambhava, the Sakya tradition, Sachin, uh, Sakya Pandita, Sachin Kung, and Sachin, Sachin Kunga Nipo, imagining the Karmapas of the Kaju lineage, imagining Lama Tsongkhapa of the Galupa lineage and his spiritual sons, Kirtup Jay, Jelsup Jay, imagining Basu Chuji Jetson, Jayan Sheba, Panchen Sun Andrapa, Gonchu Jimmy Wampo, Janja Rilpi Dorje, all these incredibly holy beings we're so fortunate to be connected to. The seventh Dalai Lama all fits into these range of holy beings and our lineage uh, and our understanding of emptiness and bodhicitta comes because we're connected to all of these beings I've just mentioned. Imagine all of the highest yoga tantra deities, yoga tantra deities, performance tantra deities, action tantra deities. Another great blessing we have from Buddha Shakyamuni. The Buddha Shakyamuni brought the Vajrayana teachings to this world. Very, very few Buddhas and the thousand Buddhas that'll come and millions and millions and or billions of eons. Uh, only a few will teach the Tantrayana Vajrayana and Buddha Shakyamuni was one of them. And here we are at a time when we can connect to the four classes of Tantra uh, and understand how to transform the four types of desire uh, into the path to enlightenment. Incredible. Imagining all the 35 Buddhas in the space in front of you with those incredible powers of basis of purification. We can get rid of eons of non-virtue by just proclaiming their names and making prostrations to them. Imagining the protector deities of the small, medium, and great scope. Imagining Paul and Lama, all these holy, holy beings there that have been sworn uh, to the Buddha that they will protect the Dharma. They will protect those who are practicing the Dharma. And we're so connected to them as Dharma practitioners because they vowed to protect us. Now, recognize that we're here for a reason. Why did you come here? Why did we come here tonight? What made, what made us decide to take time out of our life to attend a teaching on Buddhism? Uh, maybe it's because we've been attending a teaching on Buddhism because we found it helpful. But why did we originally start to seek out a philosophical path? It's because we needed answers to a lot of questions that everybody wants answers to if they think about them long enough and don't try to just push them out of their mind. Why do I suffer? What will happen after I die? Why are some people so blessed and some people have so many misfortunes? How can all of these discrepancies be? 
How can this be fair? How could a world be so the way that it is and have any kind of sense made of it? Why am I in a better position than others and in such a worse position than others? How do I make sense of this? How do I make sense of the fact when I'm even feeling happy, there's an underlying hum of dissatisfaction and a craving for something else? Why is that? Why is this occurring? Why do I have to keep feeling this devastation, this tragic feeling inside me of loss? Pick your loss, pick your separation. Think about it for a moment and think about that feeling where you feel like the elevator's going down, but you're not in an elevator and you've just realized something that scares you so much or shocks you so much or terrifies you so much or makes you so sad and puts you into a despair that can last for days, weeks, months. Why does this happen? How can this happen? How can one horrible misery destroy maybe five years of everything's just been going so great and I think life is good? How can one moment of misery destroy all of that and just make everything seem bad? How can I just go from this person who has such a positive, optimistic outlook from one moment, in one moment, to somebody who's so negative in the next moment? How is this possible? Does everybody's mind work like this? So these are the questions that I think bring a lot of us to the Dharma. And then when we get to the Dharma and we find out that there's answers actually to these questions that logically make sense, we start to believe that there's a way out of suffering. None of us want suffering. We start to believe that there's a way to get to the highest amount of happiness because we've noticed in our own lives that the way we felt the most kind of bliss or happiness was in connection to loving one kind of person or thing. Usually person is where we get that highest bliss, having a child, finding a new loved one, right? That, that, that bliss, that high, high, high bliss. And it's logical that that could be expanded if I could make it just more than one person. It's logical. So we start to see that this happiness I crave, this happiness that would always be, that wouldn't jump from, oh, I feel happy, but it's not the highest happiness I had. So there's a little dissatisfaction in here. So now the happiness that I had that was just a little dissatisfying is now just not good at all because there's something that I've jumped to that I find is much better that doesn't have any more potential to bring me a different result than the first thing did. <laughs> so Buddha came and gave us the solution to all of our problems and told us that if we relied upon the fact that all composite things are impermanent, meaning that all composite things rely upon causes and that results are concordant with the cause and we can see that our happiness and our suffering is an impermanent event, then it has to be caused. And if that's the case, then we have to figure out exactly what causes, you know, getting rid of suffering, what causes suffering, stop doing that. Uh, and what gets rid of suffering, start doing that. And what causes happiness and just do that. And the Buddha figured it out and came to show us we're so blessed. So this is a universal thing that everybody would want to know about. And when you become a bodhisattva, when you start to really engage in these practices, uh, you will start to figure out how to connect with every single sentient being in the universe. It will be your goal to teach the Dharma to, in the best way possible for them to hear each individual's ears to every single sentient being in the universe. You're going to figure out how to do that. And you're going to become able to actually do that as a Buddha in a complete way. But you're going to practice doing that and get better and better at doing that all the way along the Bodhisattva path. So I'm not a bodhisattva yet. I don't know if you're a bodhisattva yet. I can only speak from my mind. But the only way I'll become a bodhisattva uh, is to start acting in ways, familiarizing my mind with ways, uh, uh, the ways of a bodhisattva. Uh, and then the more and more my mind uh, starts to kind of want to be like that and pretend to be like that, uh, the more, the closer I get to being able to transform it into that. So now we're trying to create imprints within our mind that will ripen into 
uh, our bodhicitta, which is a mind that wishes to become a Buddha for the sake of all sentient beings, but not just once, forever. <laughs> it's a mind that will continuously be there and could only be lost for a very short period of time once you get it along the path. And then it's really irreversible in terms of your bodhicitta. Uh, there's a short window once you become a bodhisattva where you could say the heck with this <laughs> and go back to the Hinayana or, or uh, individual liberation path. Um, but this, once you know you get kind of going, take the bodhisattva vow, uh, get to the medium stage of the path of accumulation after you achieve bodhicitta, which is at the small stage of the path of accumulation, then you're cooking and you won't reverse, uh, you know, any longer. Uh, so uh, the more and more we reinforce this, may I become a Buddha for the sake of all sentient beings. I want to work for all sentient beings. I want to start, you know, acting in the ways of a bodhisattva. I want to start conditioning my mind to be like a bodhisattva. Uh, the quicker we are going to get to the path of accumulation, uh, where we uh, are called a, a son of, or daughter of the Buddhas, a bodhisattva. Um, so now we're going to engage in some uh, pretending exercises, uh, unless you're able to really pull off in a not pretend way this exercise, uh, and you're on a much higher level, and you're here just maybe uh, to get rid of those remaining obstructions on the remaining bodhisattva grounds. Uh, um, maybe that's the case. Uh, but uh, either way, um, uh, let's just uh, imagine that we're bringing uh, every single sentient being here uh, for beings like me, imagine it, for higher beings that could actually like emanate a body somehow right now <laughs> to more sentient beings emanate those bodies don't you don't have to imagine it i'm calling on anyone who could emanate emanate to every single sentient being in the universe or as many as you could and then imagine the rest that you you can't get to uh, because only the buddha uh, could get to every single sentient being in the universe in terms uh, and know exactly what they need because only the buddha uh, is omniscient, but the bodhisattvas become more and more powerful. And as we learn about, uh, as they're you know getting more advanced on the three moralities, uh, they become more and more powerful through the stages uh, up through those ten bodhisattva grounds. Uh, so let's imagine we bring everyone here, uh, and they all get to hear whatever it is they need to hear uh, in order to abandon uh, afflictive obstructions and obstructions to omniscience, so that so that they can become the Buddha that we want to become. Uh, so let's share our minds with all sentient beings. Let's imagine that we connect with every single sentient being in the universe. Stop allowing your mind to be so small and to have so many biases because you think that it helps you to have biases. Be intelligent, be wise, and know, you know, be able to differentiate right from wrong. But understand that those beings that you find uh, that are maybe harming others, that you find distasteful, it does need your love so badly. Uh, uh, and they're merely under the influence of the same thing that you're under the influence of when you do things that you don't want to do. Uh, so we recognize that, you know, we all have this self-grasping ignorance that spins us out of control. Uh, and that spinning out of control could be so out of control uh, to the point of being uh, murderers that we've been in previous lives. And that self-grasping ignorance is what causes our mind to be so small. And when we think we're being generous, when we think that we're being compassionate and loving, it's really just attachment. Uh, and there's something in there for us. Uh, and, you know, we can, even with contaminated virtues that aren't, in virtues that aren't imbued with the, you know, the kind of understanding of emptiness, uh, there's ranges of power that those virtues have. Uh, so we want to come from the best motivation possible, uh, even if it's in an, in an activity that's still contaminated uh, in terms of, you know, pathways. We don't need to get into the details, but some of you know exactly what I mean. So uh, even if it is that, there's degrees of what that virtue that is contaminated will produce for us that will allow us to be able to progress on the path. Uh, so um, let's try to get as most the much as much 
uh, virtue as we can. Om Sambhada Sambhada Bhamana Zara Mahazoa Om. Om Mara Mara Bhamana Gara Mahazoa Om. Om Sambhada Sambhada Bhamana Zara Mahazoa Om. Mara Mara Bhamana Gara Mahazoa Om. Om Sambhada Sambhada Bhamana Zara Mahazoa Om. Om Mara Mara Bhamana Gara Mahazoa Om. Om Sambhada Sambhada Bhamana Zara Mahazoa Om. Mara Mara Bhamana Gara Mahazoa Om. I put an extra in there in case I did it wrong once. <laughs> That's the multiplying uh, virtue mantra. Uh, so let's get the most virtue we can because we know we're learning three moralities. We have to gather virtue. We have to accumulate this. We have these accumulations of method and wisdom that we need. We need ripening paths. We need liberating paths. We need to do all of this in order to become Buddhas. Uh, so let's imagine we bring all sentient beings here uh, and we're as in, in order to lead them uh, to these teachings. Imagine that we bring all hell, hungry ghosts, animal, humans, demigods, and gods here, imagining as many as you can, Un make your mind as big as you can, uh, and don't cheat. Uh, use beings that actually you know about, and then you can fill in the blanks with things that you're not so sure of what they would look like in a you know a hot cold surrounding hell or a hungry ghost or uh, you know it's really easy to say oh the, all those hell and hungry ghost beings and then not think about you know the person that you got in an argument with yesterday <laughs> the mind training is about transforming your relationship with that person uh not as much the imaginary one uh you know you'll have relationships with the ones you can only imagine now as you progress but the ones we can really work on, the ones that we can litmus test our practice with, acid test our practice with, are the ones that we actually have around us. Uh, so just a tip Kamala Sheila gives us uh, when we're trying to engage in meditation uh, on love and compassion and so forth, that we should like use actual beings uh, and then build on, on those, you know, you know, starting, you know, it's easiest to start with our friends, then go to neutrals and then to enemies if we have to do it in a graded fashion uh, in terms of our ability to just start, you know, stacking those beings in. Uh, um, but uh, yeah, uh, let's use as much as we can actual objects of observation that can transform our minds that we can then go and see when we interact with that person and tomorrow or the next day, if our, the minute that we see them, if there's a different feeling that's occurring, because we've done this meditation on love and compassion, because we've, you know, tried to generate bodhicitta in a contrived way, let's see if that can affect our minds in a way in our day-to-day -day basis, way before we're bodhisattvas, and, and we'll be able to gauge it because we'll run into that person that we were having a hard time with. And we probably aren't going to run into anytime soon uh, someone in the surrounding hell to know if we're really making this kind of mind uh, occur. Uh, so we're using our lives, we're taking our lives and we're doing life. <laughs> we're taking the mirror of the Dharma while we're doing the life and we're seeing, you know, is this really working? A am, am I still really feeling this just gut reaction of aversion towards this person? Or has there been a loosening there? Has there been more of an understanding, more of an empathy there? At least it says, you just, you, you're spinning out of control just like I'm spinning out of control. Uh, and my mind is spinning out of control because of something I previously did, just as it says in the text that we read last week, seeing all of this going on, that I'm, I'm having this experience because of something I previously did, something I previously did, and now I'm having this experience because I have self-grasping ignorance. You're out of control because you have self-grasping ignorance. Now you're going to have to have somebody having giving you a hard time in the future and this helps me to get a better perspective on things hell hungry ghost animal human demigods and gods imagine you bring them all here all the holy beings are here so we imagine every being in the universe is here and now we'll recite the heart sutra thank you everybody for joining the Sutra of the Heart of Transcendent Knowledge. Thus have I heard once the Blessed One was dwelling in Rajagri at Vulture Peak Mountain, together with a great gathering of the Sangha of monks and a great gathering of the Sangha of Bodhisattvas. At that time, the Blessed One entered the Samadhi that expresses the Dharma called profound illumination 
And at the same time, noble Avokateshvara, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, while practicing the profound Prajaparamita, saw in this way, he saw the five skandhas to be empty of nature. Then through the power of the Buddha, Venerable Shariputra said to noble Avokateshvara, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, how should a son or daughter of noble family train who wishes to practice the profound Prajaparamita? Addressed in this way, noble Avokateshvara, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva said to Venerable Shariputra, O Shariputra, a son or daughter of noble family who wishes to practice the profound Prajaparamita should see in this way. Seeing the five skandhas to be empty of nature. Form is emptiness. Emptiness also is form. Emptiness is no other than form. Form is no other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, perception, formation, and consciousness are emptiness. Thus, Shariputra, all dharmas are emptiness. There are no characteristics. There is no birth and no cessation. There is no impurity and no purity. There is no decrease and no increase. Therefore, Shariputra, in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no perception, no formation, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no appearance, no sound, no smell, no taste, no touch, no dharmas, no eye, datu, up to no mind, datu, no datu of dharmas, no mind, consciousness, datu, no ignorance, no end of ignorance, up to no old age and death, no end of old age and death, no suffering, no origin of suffering, no cessation of suffering, no path, no wisdom, no attainment, and no non-attainment. Therefore, Shariputra, since the Bodhisattvas have no attainment, they abide by means of Prajaparamita. Since there is no obscuration of mind there is no fear they transcend falsity and attain complete nirvana all the buddhas of the three times by means of prajaparamita fully awaken to unsurpassable true complete enlightenment therefore the great mantra of prajaparamita the mantra of great insight the unsurpassed mantra the unequal mantra the mantra that calms all suffering should be known as truth since there is no deception prajaparamita mantra is said in this way Te ata on gate gate paragate parasangate bodhi soha te ata on gate gate paragate parasangate bodhi soha te ata on gate gate paragate parasangate bodhi soha te ata on gate gate paragate parasangate bodhi soha te ata on gate gate paragate parasangate bodhi soha Thus, Shariputra, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, should train in profound Prajnaparamita. Then the Blessed One arose from that samadhi and praised noble Avokateshvara, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, saying, Good, good, O son of noble family. Thus it is, O son of noble family. Thus it is. One should practice the profound Prajnaparamita just as you have taught, and all the Tathagatas will rejoice. When the Blessed One had said this, Venerable Shariputra and noble Avokateshvara, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, that whole assembly in the world with its gods, humans, Asuras, and Gandharvas, rejoiced and praised the words of the Blessed One. I prostrate to the gatherings of Dakinis in the three chakras who abide in the holy yoga of using space. By your power of clairvoyance and magical emanation, look after practitioners like a mother looks after her child. Aga Samarata Shandara Samaraya Me De Ata Hong Gate Gate Paragate Parasangati Bodhisoha. By the truth of the existence of the three jewels, may all inner and outer hindrances and adversities be overcome. May they become non existent. May they be pacified. May they be completely pacified. May all negative forces opposed to the Dharma be completely pacified. May the host of 80,000 obstacles be pacified. May we be separated from all adverse conditions to the Dharma, and may we obtain all circumstances conducive to the Dharma. May there be auspiciousness, happiness, and well-being here, right now. Baba Ganju Sanji Gaye Dembe Doji Shil Loba Doji Mebo Doji Shiva Doji Dragi Baji Medu Bishu Danji Shitting Gaye Soha Gere Doja Jishu Shiva Dan Medu Nube Jin Dan Dewa Dan Tumba Junji Bon Zon Zon Joji Dashi De Jan Den Da De Le Make a mandala. Is there anything we can make a mandala offering? Uh, the fundamental ground is scented with incense and strewn with flowers, adorned with Mount Meru, four continents, the sun and the moon. I imagine this is a Buddha land and offer it. May all sentient beings enjoy this pure realm. Holy Lamas high, wrap the sky of your Dharma bodies in massive clouds of knowledge and love. 
and let them pour upon the earth of your disciples as we are ready, a shower of rain, the teachings deep and wide. I send forth this jeweled mandala to you, precious guru. Just hold one moment, everyone. We're, we have a very much barking dog. There's probably deer outside or something. So uh, not only for your benefit, but our windows are open for our neighbor's benefit. <laughs> it's not always fun to hear uh, for barking pit bulls because once one gets started, one's sleeping here very gently. I don't know. Not not joining in with the choir, uh, but there's some seems to be some object of observation uh, that either is very attractive or very very repulsive <laughs> to Suma and the gang uh, that's making them bark and react. And we do the same thing, right? Uh, we have some sort of object that we bark or love run at. <laughs> We say, hey, 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 or we say, get out of here, get out of here, get out of here. We do the same thing based on the object, <laughs> based on an object, you know, that you, and then we come into contact with it, pay attention to it. And then we discriminate it as, you know, having some sort of qualities. And then we feel some way about it and we're off to the races. So, you know, how far away are we from operating like animals uh, uh, and knowing uh, that uh, we have so much more capacity. We should expect more from ourselves uh, and take examples in life like this and say, oh, do I do that? Well, dogs do that. Wow, I'm kind of like just following senses. I'm just following my senses, my eye sense, my ear sense, my nose sense, my tongue sense, how things feel. I'm just running after that, just like an animal is running after it, you know, how can I be less like an animal? Well, I'll have to know what those objects are about. <laughs> I'll have to know what this subject that's observing those objects is really about if I want to fix uh, the kind of my interaction with them. So I'm not just barking or going ah, woo, at them. <laughs> so because neither of those two states are very reasonable. Both of those states we incur kind of errors in. <laughs> we really do. When we're chasing after something we want so badly, we're missing a lot of kind of things, details around it uh, that we should, and especially the main detail that it couldn't possibly have that quality of greatness that we think it has because it's empty and it's, abs and it's empty of inherent existence. So... Uh, anyway, it's just interesting when we have a moment in life, do we use it uh, to learn, think about the Dharma? Uh, and it cued, cued me because we're in the kind of section in the diploma course where we're going over kind of consciousness and sense powers and, uh, you know, so forth. Uh, and, and the objects and, and how we relate to them and how all of those things create our trouble because of how our self-grasping ignorance, grasping at the self of person and phenomena. So we feel like we ourselves, this person imputed on the five aggregates, isn't imputed on the five aggregates. We're just like really here objectively existent. And we feel like the, ob you know, all other phenomena other than this person here is also objectively uh, existent. Uh, so uh, I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddhas, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Through the merit I create by teaching the Dharma, may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddhas, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Through the merit I create by teaching the Dharma, may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddhas, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Through the merit I create by teaching the Dharma, may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. Sanye Jalan Zaye Jalan La. Janju Badu Dani Jazu Ji Dagi Jiji Ji Bezanji Drola Benji Sanji Dubajo Sanji Jadan Zaji Janan La Janju Badu Dani Jazu Ji Dagi Jiji Ji Bezanji Drola Benji Sanji Dubajo Sanje Jadan Zaji Janan La 
Yanje Badu Danye Jazuji Dagi Jeje Ji Bezananji Drala Benji Zanje Dubarjo You are attached to this life. You are not a spiritual practitioner. If you are attached to samsara, you have no renunciation. If you are attached to your own self-interest, you have no bodhicitta. If there is grasping, you do not have the view. So there's the mirror uh, related to our, our <coughs> spiritual practitioner uh, status. <laughs> and if we are a spiritual practitioner, where we kind of fit into the path when we look at the stages of the path, uh, if we are a spiritual practitioner, which means we've, you know, abandoned or given up attachment to this life, uh, then the next thing would be we would give up attachment to samsara, uh, you know, and we see, have we done so? Do we have renunciation? You know, uh, if we're attached to anything within the six realms of cyclic existence, uh, we don't have renunciation because renunciation is a desire uh, to emerge from cyclic existence, uh, day and night seeking transcendent liberation, as it says in the three principal paths by Lama Tsongkhapa. So do we have that? Uh, do we have any kind of attachment to any of the six realms? Uh, we got rid of it in the small scope to the lower realms, but have we been able to advance as we get into the medium scope, into this idea where we want to be liberated, we want to achieve uh, uh, nirvana? Have we been able to get our mind to this idea where we only want liberation? And we just kind of throw away all of the ideas that there's something here in any among the six realms of cyclic existence to offer me, that has to offer, good to offer to me. So here's the mirror. Has that happened? Has that occurred? Uh, you know, do I have any uh, kind of self-cherishing, self-interest? Is that there? You know, you know, have I been able to start to care about others. I understand maybe I've gotten to this point where I want out so much. All I think about is me selfishly getting out. But then there's a big step there that has to be taken if you want to become a Buddha. And that is getting rid of the self-cherishing attitude. So if there's any self-centeredness, you don't have bodhicitta. We, we're starting with a lot of self-centeredness in the medium scope where we're just trying to get out for ourselves alone. Yes, there's love and compassion, I understand, but it's a, it's a selfish kind of vehicle. If we look at the lesser vehicle. It's a selfishness that's there. And that there's remnants of it that make you not a Buddha. So do we have this mind? Even if we have renunciation and day and night we want out, do we want everyone out? Do we want to become a Buddha day and night? Is that there? Or do we, or is it about us or is it about everyone? Is our goal about us and everyone or just about us? We have to ask ourselves these questions. And that, luckily, we have these texts that lay it out so clearly. Do we have any grasping? Do we have, and when it says if there's grasping, you don't have the view, it's a very profound statement there. It means grasping at even the smallest particle of having an inherent existence. And we hear of, Baba Vega and Chandrashita and Kamala Shila, they are grasping at inherent existence according to the way they write. <laughs> they believe their self characteristics of phenomena conventionally, that there's nestness. It's a staircase to get to the no nestness, but still have existence and just have mere imputation. But this idea of mere imputation that the Prasangika school presents isn't at a level that's being presented at the autonomy school and below. When we look at these great masters that we are so devoted to, and when we can begin to articulate the views and know that all of these views are a staircase to that final view of the Prasangika view, we can see how important it is. Because it's very easy to say, oh, okay, these, you know, everything is just uh, you know, coming from my mind. You know, it's all subjective. Um, but then to say, to be able to posit external things. It's not just your mind. There's things out there. And then why am I calling that a chair? And why am I calling that a dog? Well, the middle, the, the, the school below the Prisangiko school says, because of course, 
there is some chairness over there and some dogness over there. But it doesn't become a chair or a dog until you as a subject come into the picture. So it takes subject, it takes this subject and object to bring it in. But there's the only way I could, the world wouldn't make any sense, Baba Vega and crew say. If I, they, there was no nestness there, I could call a dog a chair and it would make sense to everybody because it wouldn't matter because a dog, it, it wouldn't, there would be no convention. So the autonomy school even says, even thing, though things don't truly exist, they conventionally have self-characteristics, but they don't truly exist because they don't come into being until you show up. So it takes both. And then Chandrakirti and Nagarjuna say, no self-characteristics. Basis of designation, and that thing comes into the power of being through your mere imputation. Your subjectivity decides what that is. And that's why I can see water, a God can see nectar, and a hungry ghost can see pus at the same exact object, we'll call it, looking at the same thing. But there's something we're all looking at. And if it had waterness, hungry ghost would see water. And if it had pusness, I'd see it. And if it had nectarness, we'd all see it, right? Or you know what I'm getting at. So Chandrakirti and Nagarjuna dismiss this idea that there could be, but somehow keep everything in, in, intact and say that they only things could work, only things could be a chair or a dog if they had no nestness because of dependent origination, because of cause and effect, and because of labeling, there's only way if there was some static nestness there, it couldn't change. It would always just be it. There would be something there that was always nestness there. But we see it, it, there's so much subjectivity and there's nothing from the side of the object that's definable as what we say it is. It doesn't have those inherent characteristics that the autonomy school would say it has. The autonomy school says it doesn't truly exist because of the fact that it's taking me too, coming into the picture to name it, but I'm naming something that should be named that. And Chandrakirti says, I'm naming something that should be named that for me. And the hungry ghost is naming something that should be named that in the hungry ghost world for a hungry ghost consciousness. Very profound, not something you understand overnight. If there's grasping, you do not have the view. It's a big statement. There's grasping at the self of person, grasping at the self of phenomena. You know, I grasp at Jeff, but then I say, this is Jeff's hand. How many of these phenomena do I take away before there's no more person? <laughs> so you have grasping itself and grasping a, a person and, and grasping itself a phenomena. How many of phenomena do I take away until there's no more self? So we see the obvious answer is collection with designation. You can't possibly have something that's independent of it, but we can't say it exists in it. When we start to look closer, is Jeff the, the earth element, water element, fire element, wind element. Could we find Jeff if we didn't have those elements? Is there all a, a gajillion Jeffs here with different details? No, there's a collection that's suitably to be, suitable to be named as Jeff, that I name as Jeff right now. I'm Jeff. And conceptually, I now have this image in my mind that I am a me. <laughs> and you have an image in your mind that I'm Jeff and that you're a you. Uh, so we have to kind of start to see what this, I'm a Jeff and you're a you. What comes up to your mind when you're thinking of subject and object? Are you thinking that they appear to lack inherent existence or do they seem very solid and objectively existent? I know Jeff feels very Jeffy. And I know that over there, Lorinda seems very objectively existent. I mean, I could, you know, if I went far enough, I could, you know, touch her sweatshirt. I mean, how could it be? 
that there isn't something that could stand alone on its, from its own side over there named Lorinda. How is that possible that there's an object over there? And then the, when Lorinda is thinking Lorinda, she's a subject. So we see what's subject, where's object? <laughs> anyway, so we're looking at Lama Tsongkhapa's source of all my good. And all of what I just mentioned obviously is the subject matter of anything that contains a complete path because you can't become a Buddha without renunciation, bodhicitta, and the correct view of emptiness. Impossible. Uh, so everything that we just mentioned uh, is a summary of everything that you need uh, to become a Buddha. Uh, you have to figure out, you know, how to not grasp at anything, get rid of your, you know, self-cherishing attitude, not, you know, be attached to samsara. Uh, and then obviously, if you're not attached to samsara, you're not attached to the lower half of it. <laughs> you know, so you became a spiritual practitioner when you decided the lower half of it stank. Uh, um, but that doesn't mean that you just decided it. It means that you decided that now, day and night, I'm going to do something about it because I'm no longer attached to this life. Uh, very interesting distinction you have to make when you say that you abandon, you want to be free from the lower realms. That doesn't mean that, oh yeah, I don't want to do that. That means that you're doing something about it. When you have this renunciation related, that's like a, not real renunciation, but we could call it that. Let's call it it tonight and let the anvil fall on my head. It's like a renunciation related to the lower realms of cyclic existence, the hell hungry ghost and animal. You definitely want to emerge. So when you have this desire to definitely emerge from cyclic existence, so Kappa says it's day and night. You're seeking that result to be free from cyclic existence. Now think about the small scope. It's not that you just are like, you don't want to be born as a hell hungry ghost or animal. You're day and night seeking a way out of that. <laughs> So people say small scope, oh, it's such a like small practice, but this is day and night doing something about not becoming a hell hungry ghost or an animal, doing something about that. Because what is it? Arya Deva has to say that uh, um, most beings are involved in the ignoble, non-virtue. Therefore, most ordinary beings go to the lower realms. So we think it's like, oh, the small scope, what do we need to do? Well, what are we practicing that for? But that small scope practitioner that's so small is day and night doing something about the fact that he or she in the next moment could have the 12 links activate right before death and be thrust into an animal intermediate state and maybe stay there until you're born into the womb uh, uh, or uh, or an egg uh, of an animal, or, you know, and, th and that's it, you know? So what are we doing about making sure that's not going to happen? Because the, the animals don't seem to be able to do much about spiritual path, but I've met a lot of humans recently that are making really great progress on it, really trying hard. I mean, it's amazing when you start to really try to find like-minded Buddhist philosophy people uh, you find there's people who are really engaging in these practices out there and having realizations and, and having them change their minds. And people who've been doing it 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, uh, you know, uh, some even almost 60 years. Uh, and it's incredible that we have these beings among us uh, that we can use as guides and as examples uh, and, and, and get encouragement from and say, oh, it's, it is, it is uh, you know, something that's so worthwhile. Uh, and I'm not on this island of, I think it's worthwhileness, uh, you know, alone, or it's not just one or two of us on this kind of island. Uh, there are just so many people all over the world. When we look at uh, the Nalanda courses and we look at, you know, uh, the different programs going on all over the world where they're teaching very, very technical, systematic Buddhism. Uh, and it's incredible when you start to connect with these people uh, and start to see that, wow, this really, really does work. Uh, it, it gives you encouragement. Um, so I just wanted to share that with you uh, and encourage you all. Um, we know that in spiritual terms, the Lamrim is very clear. 
uh, that if we hang around with folks uh, who are kind of lesser qualities, we're going to kind of decline. If we hang around folks who are kind of equal to us, we'll, we'll stand our ground. But if we can hang around folks that are incredible, who are holy, folks that have really had realizations and who really dug into this, uh, then our virtues will increase and we'll be better. Uh, so we always try uh, to help everyone and engage in life. I don't mean, you know, oh, we're an elite group, but I mean, it's amazing when you can connect with those uh, who really have those higher capacities uh, and just really soak it in. And I'd say just recently uh, speaking with Jeffrey Hopkins and just seeing the vast knowledge that he has uh, and seeing the computer-like mind that he has it's in his 80s, even after being so sick, after going through a surgery and just seeing his mind, just I asked him a question about the tenant systems and his translation of cutting through appearances and, and, and I was talking with him, whatever, and, and, and hearing his mind just go right there and go, well, I remember when I was translating at Kenser uh, uh, Lakedon, uh, gave me a lot of comments and commentary on it, but I never just took that as a word for it and changed anything. Uh, uh, I always looked for more sources and it was just incredible. It's what we were talking about something very detailed. I'm not gonna get into it now, but it was incredible to hear him just draw back to 20, 30, you know, so many years before about an abstract point about the selflessness of person versus phenomena related to sound uh, uh, in, in the tenet system text in the Prasangika section. Uh, and it came up in the, in the class today with Geshe Dorje Damdu, uh, where there seems to be something strange in the text. Uh, so Dorje, Geshe Dorje Damdu made a note uh, and he said, oh, I think there's something that kind of appears strange uh, here. And I don't think Gunter Jimmy Wamba would have held that. That's not the philosophical stance. It's one word, philosophical stance of the Prisangika. You know, it says, you know, the selflessness of person of sound. It should say selflessness of phenomena of sound. Uh, so in the notes, Geshe Dorje Damdu says, I checked with Gen Paul Dendrapa Rinpoche, uh, and he concurs that it should be selflessness of phenomena. Uh, and in Jeffrey Hopkins' book, Cutting Through Appearances, he wrote Selflessness of Phenomena. So we need to check with Jeffrey uh, and see, you know, uh, why, you know, if he, you know, came to the conclusion I did, or if he found a source where there wasn't an error in maybe translating it from written text to written text over the years uh, from the time of Gonchu Jimmy Wampo. Uh, so it was very interesting that the Nalanda class ended, and then uh, we were supposed to have this conversation anyway coming up. Uh, and the reason I'm bringing this up is only to say that, you know, we take someone who's just like us, who's, you know, born, uh, you know, a shop, uh, a lumber yard manager's son or something like this, or hardware store's son, owner or manager's son, uh, and, you know, in Rhode Island uh, and in, lived in Connecticut also, uh, very ordinary, uh, was ordinary, you know, as someone who's like a genius computer can be, but also just, you know, going through like the schools like us and everything, but is able to have conversations just like a Larampa Geshe and has mannerisms and has an affect that is just like a being like the ones that I've been able to be around, like Geshe Lobsang Gompo and Kenser Geshe Wanda. Uh, and then we see Lama Alan Wallace. I've never had the pleasure of being around him, but I see the videos. I see and there are many other Westerners, Ani Tupton Children. I don't want to create this exclusive thing, but I'm just speaking of something that I directly experienced today. Uh, and whenever, you know, something like that happens, I think it's encouraging. And I want to encourage you all uh, because why is that being like that? Why is Gen Nenden, John Beldrapala, Jeffrey Hopkins like that? It's because he put the effort in day and night, translating, giant Sheba. Gonja Jimmy Wombo, translating Janja Ruby Dorje, Son Kappa, translating Mipom. I mean, not being satisfied with partial instructions. And if we look at Kenser Geshe Wandak saying, never, and Son Kappa, never be satisfied with partial instructions. And we want to have a role model. We don't have to get exotic. We, we don't have to travel. You know, we don't have to travel even, you know, from where I'm at, you know, maybe you could drive a few hours to find a being like this. So realize we, we all have this potential. And sometimes we feel like 
It takes an exotic place and an exotic being to realize things. But it's just not true. And we sell ourselves short because we're always looking for other power. And we have to look within here. And that's why the Buddha said we all become Buddhas because we all have the same mind that has the potential of perfection. So uh, let's go into the, what time is it? I have no idea. It's 810. Um, okay, well, what I'd like to do is <clears throat> I'm going to read the source of all my good quicker than normal, and then I'm going to go right to the stanza uh, where we left off, because I want to complete something tonight. Um, I mean, I don't have to do anything, but I'd like to, <laughs> you know, I'd like to complete something in my mind uh, I had thought of tonight uh, around the three moralities. So again, the source of all my good. Pabunka Rinpoche breaks it into four categories. We're all familiar with those four categories. I won't give the, those categories or commentary. Let's just read the root text and then go right to the commentary on the three moralities. The source of all my good, the source of all my good, my kind Lama, my Lord, bless me first to see that taking myself to him in the proper way is the very root of the path and grant me then to serve and follow him with all my strength and, rever strength and reverence. Bless me first to realize that the excellent life of leisure I found just this once is ever so hard to find and ever so valuable. Grant me then to wish and never stop to wish that I could take its essence night and day. My body and the life in it are fleeting as the bubbles in the sea froth of a wave. Bless me first thus to recall the death that will destroy me soon and help me find sure knowledge that after I've died, the things I've done, the white or black and what those deeds will bring to me, follow always close behind as certain as my shadow. Grant me then ever to be careful to stop the slightest wrongs of the many wrongs we do and try to carry out instead each and every good of the many that we may. Bless me to perceive all that's wrong with the seemingly good things of this life. I can never get enough of them. They cannot be trusted. They are the door to every pain I have. Grant me then to strive instead for the happiness of freedom. Grant that these pure thoughts may lead me to be watchful and to recall what I should be doing. Grant me to give the greatest care to make the vows of morality the essence of my practice. They are the root of Buddha's teaching. I have slipped and fallen into the sea of this suffering life. Bless me to see that every living being, everyone my own mother has fallen into. Grant me then to practice the wish for enlightenment to take on myself the task of freeing them all. Bless me to see clearly that the wish itself is not enough for if I am not well trained in the three moralities, I cannot become a Buddha. Grant me then a fierce resolve to master the Bodhisattva vows. Grant that I may quickly gain the path where quietude and insight join together, one which quiets my mind from being distracted to wrong objects, the other which analyzes the perfect meaning in the correct way. Grant that once I've practiced well, the path shared and become a vessel that is worthy. I enter with perfect ease the way of the diamond, highest of all ways, holiest door to come inside for the fortunate and good. Bless me to know with genuine certainty that when I've entered thus, the cause that gives me both the high attainments is to keep my pledges and my vows most pure. Grant me then always to keep them even at the cost of my life. Bless me next to realize as well as I can the crucial points of both the steps, the essence of the secret ways. Grant me then to practice as the holy ones have spoken, putting all my effort in and never leaving off the practice of the four times highest that there is. Bless me, grant me that the spiritual friend who shows me this good road and all my true companions in this quest live long and fruitful lives. Bless and grant me that the reign of obstacles, things within me or outside me that could stop me now stop and end forever. In all my lives, may I never live apart from my perfect lamas. May I bask in the glory of the Dharma. May I fulfill perfectly every good quality of every level and path and reach then quickly the place where I become myself, the one who holds the diamond, where I become Vajradhara, myself, like Vajradhara, with all those perfect qualities. Uh, so here, this is that aspiration at the end. Um, I, I know all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. They have all these excellent qualities. Uh, you know, may I quickly reach the place where I have all those excellent qualities, uh, because we all will become Buddha. Uh, this is something we have to remember. And that's why it's absurd to sell ourselves short, because we all have Buddha nature. We all have a mental consciousness. This is in the nature of clear uh, light and unsullied. Uh, just like the Buddha's mental consciousness was in the nature of clear light and was uh, uh, um, unsullied. Um, and unfortunately for both parties, it, you know, ours currently and Buddha's before, uh, there were, you know, adventitious defilements and stains and the Buddha figured out how to get rid of them and we haven't. Buddha told us how to get rid of them and we just have to do what the Buddha did to get rid of them. Pretty cool, pretty simple, straightforward. So 
we go right to the stanza that I wanted to bless me to see clearly that the wish itself enough is not enough. So if we look at bodhicitta, there's aspiring bodhicitta and engaged bodhicitta. Aspiring bodhicitta occurs when we first generate bodhicitta and we say, may I become a Buddha for the sake of all sentient beings. And it's not just like, okay, I want to do that. It's day and night. Uh, you're working at uh, uh, that, you know, goal uh, for the sake of all sentient beings. So it's just like renunciation where day and night, you're looking at getting out of samsara, day and night, you're looking at becoming a Buddha. Just like small scope, day and night, you're figuring out how to not be in the lower realms. Medium scope, day and night, looking at how to get out of samsara. Great scope, day and night, looking out, looking at how to become a Buddha for the sake of all sentient beings. So that wish that you generate or will generate someday, and then you'll be called bodhisattva, uh, boy or girl, uh, bodhisattva, uh, that day, um, you'll have the aspiring bodhicitta that they're talking about, the wish. But that wish isn't going to be enough. We know that you can fall still as a bodhisattva into the lesser vehicle and give up and say it's too much. All these sentient beings are too much. And you could give up with, with the, just the wish. Uh, if you just were just at that small scope, small level, the path of accumulation, uh, uh, first of all, you could lose it. And secondly, it's not enough to just wish to become a Buddha. You have to do what Shanti Deva says in the Guide to the Bodhisattva's Way of Life, and that is not just think about going somewhere, actually go somewhere. I think I'm going, going to go to New York. You start to drive to New York when you are an engaged Bodhisattva. So now you're not only wishing uh, to become a Buddha for the sake of all sentient beings, you're engaged in activities that will produce that very thing. And day and night, you're engaging in those activities. And day and night, what kind of activities are you engaging in? Well, here it says you're engaging in the three moralities, the moralities of abstaining from non-virtue, the moralities of collecting virtue, uh, and the morality of working for sentient beings. Uh, so it says that this is what you're doing. So I'm not going to get into this book tonight. So this is what you're doing. You're working on these you know, kinds of things. Uh, and then how do you really, what's the line uh, how do you become this engaged bodhisattva? So we say the three moralities, that's fine. These are categories of bodhisattva behavior um, where one of the things that will make you take this step is in, <laughs> and that's the bodhisattva vow. So the bodhisattva vow we find within that first morality categorically, we, the you know ethics of abandoning uh, um, non-virtue uh, in that first morality. Um, and when we take the bodhisattva vow, then we become engaged bodhisattvas. And it's said you're usually at, you're at the medium level of the path of accumulation and you won't lose it. <laughs> you're not going to be like the heck with it ever, ever. Uh, you will always be engaged in this process of this engaging in. You understand? You see how it makes sense? Like you're wishing, I want to become a Buddha for the sake of all sentient beings. Now you're engaging in the practice of generosity, ethics, patience, effort, concentration, wisdom. You're engaging in these perfections. You're doing things in relation to sentient beings. Uh, you're engaging in these bodhisattva vows, uh, which are all related to these, you know, your relationship to sentient beings and putting their needs before your own and understanding their individual needs uh, to the best of your ability. So you go and take these 18 root and 46 secondary vows because you are this being who day and night has said, I want to become a Buddha. So you're already in a place where it'd be realistic for you to be able to keep these bodhisattva vows in a real way. If you've generated bodhicitta and you have a mind that wants to become a Buddha for the sake of all sentient beings and you've generated and in one of the two ways, the seven point cause and effect for realizing the mind that aspires to enlightenment, you've recognized equanimity, the precept, and that all sentient beings are your mother and remember their kindness, wish to repay their kindness, love generated this love for everyone through the force of being attracted to them by finding them lovable and this great compassion for them and this extraordinary attitude that then comes in and, and turns into this incredible mind uh, of bodhicitta. Uh, all of these things have to have happened as pre-steps, as conditions of a mind that could have the arisal of this wish, but that wish isn't enough. So we see how much work we have to do, but what's so amazing is we have all of the uh, things that like, we have to do from a cause and effect perspective, from a meditation perspective, 
that will make our mind have this wish so that we'll be able to really, really take the Bodhisattva vow and be on the path of accumulation where we will no longer have any chance of falling off the Bodhisattva path and we will only uh, be on a pathway that leads to Buddhahood. And the other way, of course, is the equalizing and exchanging self with others practice, uh, where we first realize this equal equalization of self and other, where everyone's equally important. We let recognize the downfalls of the self-cherishing attitude, the benefits of cherishing other. We engage in the giving and taking practice of, of taking suffering and giving love. Uh, we, we recognize that we need to actually do this shift where we put others' needs before our own in a complete way. We make this step firm in our mind, uh, and then we meditate on this great kindness of everyone. Uh, and then we take this vow in our mind, I must do it. I must take it on myself, the task of freeing them all, which is the extraordinary attitude we find also in the seven point cause and effect. And then from that place, we recognize that we really can't even reach all sentient beings. We're not omniscient. We must become a Buddha for the sake of all sentient beings. That's the wish that we will eventually actually have the realization from that will grow from the seven point cause and effect for realizing bodhicitta and equalizing, exchanging self with others. And that wish will grow. And then that wish will serve as the mental foundation, the mental basis for us to be able to take the bodhisattva vow and become engaged bodhisattva. So uh, not to belabor this, but these are technical points that you maybe don't hear about a lot. Uh, and it's important that these technical points are understood because then you have a complete path. Then you can actually do something with your practice that is going in a graduated stages towards the goal of Buddhahood. So uh, that's what we're, uh, our, you know, the name of the game is around here. Uh, and I'm really, you know, I know we have such a short time span uh, and, and, you know, time is going by so quickly as we get older, as I get older. Uh, and I think maybe as I recognize, you know, more about impermanence and more about Buddhism, uh, my perspective on time seems to make it look faster even. It's almost like as you have more and more of a perspective about reality, it's almost like your life even speeds up quicker uh, because you're starting to like kind of see how fast it's moving uh, and, and paying attention to it a little bit more uh, than you ever did before. Uh, and that's what these this these teachings uh, where that start the Buddha started with that all composite things are impermanent uh, on impermanence uh, that starting there uh, and understanding that we're moving so fast what are we moving towards uh, aging more sickness and then death and then birth again <laughs> and all throughout a contaminated state until we figure out how to remove that which causes the contamination that's it. We remove that which causes the contamination. Samsara is over. We're faux destroyer. We remove completely from our mind those afflicted, you know, kind of places, the afflictive obstructions. And it's over. Samsara is over. We're faux destroyer. And we all will uh, hopefully, though, be a faux destroyer Buddha uh, because that's the, the, the faux destroyer, the foe of the afflictive obstructions and the obstructions to omniscience that we should be trying to defeat, not just the afflictive obstructions that the lesser vehicle, Hinayana, individual liberation, fundamental vehicle practitioner uh, will get rid of. The foe, their foe is different uh, than, than our foe. Um, and, and, and know that that's why what really differentiates uh, um, these pathways um, is the Bodhisattva sees just this abiding nirvana where a being's only gotten rid of the afflictive obstructions as a prison, an abiding nirvana like a prison, uh, because they don't have all of their needs fulfilled or all sentient beings fulfilled, and they're just locked there, thinking there's fulfillment in, in a complete way, and they're going to have to hear the Buddha snap a finger at some point, and then they'll realize the glory of the Buddha before them, because they've heard, long story, but the They've all heard the Mahayana teachings before and could even teach them. They just didn't practice them. And it comes back to their mind. They're, they're faux destroyers of the lesser vehicle. They're in nirvana. And they come out of their samadhi on ultimate truth. And they're looking at conventional reality. And, and they recognize that they are not this fully awakened one. And then they have to now cross another river again. <laughs> uh, you know, it's not 
the, they're arhats of that vehicle already. So they're good, <laughs> but they have to then do a lot of work. And what's strange is because their path was so selfish. Yeah, because their path was so selfish. It takes in the bodhisattva path. We say once you generate bodhicitta, it's three countless eons. Well, then for this being who has to then kind of go back, not go back, but start at the Mahayana path, it's 40 countless eons because there's so much of this embedded pathway of individual liberation that they've they've got. Uh, so anyway, that's what they say. I don't know. We'll have to see. Hopefully we'll be on the Mahayana path and we won't have to, you know, cross the river twice, as they say. If you're attached to this life, you're not a spiritual practitioner. If you're attached to samsara, you have no renunciation. If you're attached to your own self-interest, you have no bodhicitta. If there's grasping, you do not have the view. Big one. You can't become an, uh, liberated in any vehicle. Here, a solitary realizer or Mahayana vehicle if there's grasping. And there aren't different kinds of emptinesses depending on where you want to end up. There's one, em one emptiness. One reality is one thing. It's not a bunch of different kinds of things for different people. It's just Buddha taught different scopes to get you to the final view of the Madhyamika Prasangika view because of the Buddha's love and compassion uh, for everyone in omniscience and knowing that everyone needed a little bit of a different uh, substance of med medication uh, to heal their, uh, their heal their kind of negative emotions at that time to get them closer to the place where they could completely abandon the afflictive obstructions and obstructions to omniscience by relying on this wisdom path uh, coupled with the path of method uh, of bodhicitta. Okay, let's do, uh, what do we do? We do the Tsongkhapa. We say we hope Tsongkhapa's teachings stay here for a long time. I, I know I mean, I don't know. I just, this is where I studied from. So I can't say, I don't know where I, you know, I, there's no way I could understand what I understand uh, without Tsongkhapa. Um, but for me, um, uh, when I look at, you know, the, the different things that I've read, uh, Tsongkhapa has such an incredible way of clarifying and presenting the Prasangika view, presenting object of negation, presenting conventional and ultimate truth and seeing, being able to see that as one entity. I just, I feel that Lama Tsongkhapa really, really is incredible uh, in the way that he presents these things. Uh, and then the understanding of bodhicitta, according to the, the, the two trailblazers uh, processes and how to combine those two processes. We're so fortunate. We're like, I don't even know, winning the lottery over and over again every time we awaken uh, because we are these folks that came into contact with this nectar like Dharma. Prayer for the flourishing of Jitsun Kappa's teachings. Though he's the father, producer of all the conquerors, as a conqueror's son, he produced the thought of upholding the conqueror's dharma and infinite worlds through this truth. May the conqueror Lozong's teachings flourish. When in the presence of Buddha Indra Ketu, he made his vow, the conqueror and his offspring praised his powerful courage. Through this truth, may the conqueror Lozong's teachings flourish. That the lineage of pure view and conduct might spread, he offered a white crystal rosary to the sage who gave him a conch and prophesied. Through this truth, may the conqueror Lozong's teachings flourish. His pure view, free of eternity or destruction, his pure meditation, cleansed of dark fading and fog, his pure conduct practiced according to conqueror's orders. May the conqueror Lozong's teachings flourish. Learn it since he extensively sought out learning, reverend rightly applying it to himself, good dedicating all for beings and doctrine. May the conqueror Lozong's teachings flourish. Through being sure that all scriptures definitive and interpretive were without contradiction advice for one person's practice, he stopped all misconduct. May the conqueror Lozong's teachings flourish. Listening to the explanations of the three pitakas, realized teachings, practice of the three highest higher trainings, his skill and accomplished life story is amazing. May the conqueror Lozong's teachings flourish. Outwardly calmed and subdued by the hero's conduct, inwardly trusting in the two stages practice, he allied without clash to good paths of sutra and tantra. May the conqueror Lozong's teachings flourish, combining voidness explained as the causal vehicle with great bliss achieved by method, the effect vehicle, hard essence of 80,000 Dharma bundles. May the conqueror Lozong's teachings flourish by the power of the ocean of oath-bound doctrine, dar uh, doctrine protectors, may, like the gar main guardians of the three beings paths, the quick acting Lord Vaishravana, Karmayama, and may the conqueror Lozong's teachings flourish. In short, by the lasting of glorious gurus' lives, 
by the earth being full of good, learned, reverend holders of the teaching and by the increase of power of its patrons, may the conqueror Lozong's teachings flourish. Okay, now we pray. We do mandala offering, thanksgiving for teaching. I feel so grateful to have had these teachings from Kensar Geshe Wandak on Penchen Sonandrapa's General Meaning of Perfection, on Shanti Deva's Guide to the Bodhisattva Way of Life, and on Nagarjuna's Precious Garland and Letter to a Friend, uh, where we find all of these jewels to tell us how to generate uh, bodhicitta uh, and all of these jewels to show us, uh, you know, how to understand that even that bodhicitta and that Buddhahood you will achieve is empty of inherent existence. So let's always remember remember that in any practice that we do, uh, that the practice we're doing is empty of inherent existence. We're empty of inherent existence. Uh, you know, the meditation object is empty of inherent existence. If we're helping a sentient being, uh, we're empty, they're empty, the helping's empty. And we really, these three spheres, the emptiness of act, action, agent, and object, uh, really should be understood uh, in order to seal any kind of virtue the right way, uh, uh, to at least seal it so that it later could be really sealed, <laughs> if that makes sense. Uh, sealing it with emptiness so you can really seal it with emptiness, leaving those imprints like we talked about before with the bodhisattva and a contrived bodhicitta and imagining you could do all this and you eventually will. Very, very similar where you're imbuing your mind with this idea of the absence of of inherent existence of action, agent, and objects, so you'll eventually uh, be able to realize that uh, in, a, in a true way, in a non-contrived way, and eventually as a Buddha, uh, you will only know that while simultaneously being able to observe conventional reality. Uh, you'll be able to directly perceive the, the ultimate uh, and, and the conventional. The fundamental ground is scented with incense and strewn with flowers, adorned with Mount Meru, the four continents, the sun and the moon. I imagine this is a Buddha land and offer it. May all sentient beings enjoy this pure realm. I dedicate whatever virtues I have collected for the benefit of the teachings and of all sentient beings, and in particular for the essential teachings of Venerable Azandrapa to shine forever. I send forth this jeweled mandala to you, precious guru. Any mistakes I've made, I apologize. Uh, it's very possible. Uh, I didn't uh, try to and don't know of any offhand that I did, but any mistakes that I made, I apologize. And I, may they be purified by this mantra of Vajrasafa, imagining Vajrasafa in the space in front of you is inseparable from your uh, root guru, from your teacher, inseparable from Kensar Geshe Wanda, inseparable from His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Uh, you could say contained in one, just like we did Buddha Shakyamuni explodes into the merit field. You can imagine Vajradhara uh, if you, in your mind, are feeling a struggle with which guru? Inseparable, all contained in one, inseparable from Vajradhara. So uh, one taste is what we're really, really getting at. One taste with Vajradhara, uh, essence, one essence. I'm, I'm sorry, Vajrasattva, I apologize, Vajrasattva. Um, so we see, we do, we see our guru as one taste with Vajradhara as well. But in this case, we're going to do the Vajrasattva mantra. So I apologize for misspeaking. Imagining Vajrasattva is inseparable uh, from our root teacher. Uh, and with this uh, mantra, may our body, speech, and mind be purified by light rays and nectars that are white, red, and blue that transform into Om, Ah, Hom, uh, and purify our body, speech, and mind, respectively. Om benza sata samayama nebalaya benza sata zena bajista dida me baba suto kaya me baba subo kaya me baba anuratu me baba sava zidi me braya cha sava kama suche me hitam shi angkoro home ha ha ho bhagavan sava tata gata benza mame muka benza baba maha samaya sapa ah home hey may we always be protected by Paul and Lama who Rinpoche very clearly uh, told us and firmly told us is our protector deity. Jaramaja <laughs> 
Jarama Jarama Jaja Rama Dunja Galarajemo Rama Aja Daja Dunja Rudha Rudha Unja Jarama Jarama Jaja Rama Dunja Galarajemo Rama Aja Daja Dunja Rudha Rudha Unja I dedicate all this virtue to emulate the knowledge of the Euro Manjushri and likewise Samantabhadra as well. With whatever dedication is praised as supreme by all the conquerors who traverse the three times, I also dedicate all my roots of virtue for the sake of auspicious deeds. In that pure land surrounded by snowy mountains, you are the source of all benefit and happiness, all powerful Avogateshvara, Tenzin Jatso, may you stay until samsara's end. We're so fortunate to have His Holiness the Dalai Lama in our world. Uh, may he remain for a very long time. He says he's going to. Uh, so let's create the causes and conditions from our side and continually in our minds connect with His Holiness the Dalai Lama and request His Holiness the Dalai Lama to turn the wheel of Dharma, remain in this world, uh, because we know uh, that we are part of that process because of karma. We can only interact with that which we have the karma to interact with. So we can only have this wonderful, beautiful Bodhis Buddha in our world, Chen Rezig in our world, our samsara, mine, subjective. I only can. I mean, maybe suddenly I'm play, taken to a place where I never get to see His Holiness again, and He's still in this world. There's two ways. It's not the only the, the 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 teacher passes. I can be in a position to not ever ever hear from the teacher again, and they didn't. So. These are all obstacles that we're trying to remove. So we try to connect with our teachers so that we meet with them in our future lives, that we can keep connecting them within this life. And that in this life, if they've even passed on, we're connecting to their Dharmakaya, we're connecting to their emanation, whatever it may be that's coming to help us. So we never forget our gurus. We never forget our teachers. And we never forget that the source of all our good, the foundation of everything that good Perfect, the goodest we will become is the teacher. And the more we recognize this, the more ready for death we'll be. And those people these days, we recently heard a talk about people who are doing some kind of bardo uh, practices. And they even found that their first retreat they did on the bardo, they had to leave early. And they came to the realization it was because they didn't have guru devotion. They became scared in the retreat and they didn't have that power of the blessing of the Lama to carry them. And they went and they practiced and cultivated different kind of virtues and connectivity with the Lama and went back in to that retreat on the intermediate state and where they were able to successfully complete it and have really good things happen. Uh, so we see... Uh, you're going to die and go to an intermediate state. That's why this person's practicing it. So they know what to do. And they saw that they couldn't even start it without the guru. So let that be a lesson to all of us. And now a prayer to the one that affected my life so much. The supplication that I finished writing. I started writing when I met Rinpoche a few weeks after. And I finished writing it a year after he passed away on March 6th. Uh, uh, he passed in 2022. I wrote this 2023. A complex yogi poses as a simple monk. Homage to Kensar Geshe Wandak Rinpoche, our precious spiritual friend who is inseparable from Aryatara. I fully prostrate, covering as many atoms of the earth as possible to your pure body, speech, mind, and enlightened activities. I offer to you drinking water, bathing water, flowers, incense, candles, scented water, food, and music, purified by Om, Ah, Om. The rarity of having one million wish-fulfilling gems is a common occurrence compared to meeting with a holy teacher like you who placed the complete path to Buddhahood in our childlike hands. Like, just like Atisha who came to Tibet with a lamp to dispel the darkness of ignorance, you kind abbot arrived in the West with a lineage purer than a diamond and begged us never to be satisfied with partial instructions. The teachings of the extensive deeds and profound view lineages flowed from your lips like nectar for our ears that elucidated the teachings for beings of three capacities. Now the sound is stopped. All composite things are impermanent. You told us that all your teachers passed away and understood this sadness, entreating us to continue our studies. The Buddha does not wash away the negativities of beings, nor does he remove their miseries by his hands. His spiritual realizations are not transferred to them. It is by teaching the truth of suchness that beings are liberated. 
We are not prepared to take this difficult journey to the highest goodness of Buddhahood without your continued guidance. The sadness in our hearts would be too overwhelming. May you swiftly return to this world and take care of us in all of our lives, wherever we may be, never leaving our hearts and crowns. May all sentient beings perfectly realize renunciation, bodhicitta, and the correct view of emptiness so they know who you really are. Meaning you will have the same mind as that holy being we knew, Kensar Geshe Wandak. Not have the same mind, meaning you'll emerge with his consciousness, mm -hmm. but you'll have the same exact qualities of, of his mind. And then you'll know his mind. Lord Atisha made a statement. If you you know, never get to meet me, realize Bodhicitta and it'll be just like meeting me. Very similar to this. So thank you for listening. And I appreciate all of you. And uh, take care and try to make these teachings change your mind uh, and not just be information uh, that stacks up in your mind. Uh, make it information that then you analyze and it changes your whole world. Thank you. Bye-bye.